In this recording, we'll discuss electrolytes and fluid movement. Now, we've already learned that water is the universal solvent within the body, but what exactly does that mean? We are referring to the fact that water is able to dissolve quite a few things, both electrolytes and non-electrolytes. Now, we're going to focus on a few particular electrolytes. We're going to chat about sodium, calcium, potassium, chlorine, and bicarbonate. These are not the only electrolytes that we have, but these five play a pretty key role in uh, daily body functions. So we're just going to focus on those. So first of all, we have sodium, which is the most abundant extracellular and interstitial fluid cation. Okay, so if you remember, a cation is a positively charged ion, okay? Now, why do we have so much sodium? Because it does some good things. It is responsible for helping transmit nerve impulses through the um, propagation of action potentials. And it also helps create osmotic pressure in the extracellular fluid because the concentration of sodium within the extracellular fluid remains fairly stable. Now, because sodium is so important to us, we do have a way to regulate it. We're going to use aldosterone. Okay, If you remember, aldosterone um, is directly targeting the sodium reabsorption. Okay, Now, water passively follows, so we end up with uh, water reabsorption also, but aldosterone is directly regulating those sodium ions. Okay, Now, if we have a little too much sodium, we have hypernatremia. Okay. This could be because we are suffering from hyperaldosteronism, which is a really long word. We could maybe have just a really high salt diet, or we could be really dehydrated. So we don't necessarily have too much salt, but we don't have enough water, so it looks like we have too much salt. Speaking of salt, those are the symptoms of hypernatremia. Okay, We've got skin being flushed, we've got agitation, we've got low-grade fever, we've got thirst. Okay. Those are typical signs of hypernatremia. Now, hyponatremia, okay, so having too little sodium, could be caused by hypoaldosteronism. Okay, or instead, we could be suffering from water intoxication. So maybe actually the problem is we have too much water, but it seems like we have too little salt. Um, if that's the case, we could be suffering from cerebral edema and mental confusion, things like that. Now, calcium, okay, also another cation. Calcium is the most common ion in the body, full stop. You have more calcium in your body than any other ion that we're going to talk about or that we're not even going to talk about. Okay, you got a ton of calcium. Now, as far as in the fluids go, we do have calcium in both the extracellular fluids and the interstitial fluids. Okay. Why do we have so much calcium? Because in addition to having all the calcium in the fluids, don't forget, that's a main component of your bones and your teeth. Okay. We do use calcium for blood clotting, muscle contraction, and neurotransmitter release. So it seems like we're always talking about calcium. Okay, So it's, it's a really big deal. Now, because it's such a big deal, we do have several ways to regulate it. We use parathyroid hormone calcitonin, and even calcitriol, which if you remember, that is the active form of vitamin D. Now we could have a little too much and have hypercalcemia, which could actually be caused by hyperparathyroidism, another terribly long word. Um, these symptoms, although they are not funny, they make you giggle because you've got groans and moans and bones and stones. Okay. You're probably groaning and moaning because you've got kidney stones and because your bones are weak and that's just no good. Okay, So that makes you giggle. Not really something to laugh at, but all the rhyming makes you giggle. And then we have hypocalcemia, which could be caused by hypoparathyroidism. Um, these aren't really uh, laughable. There's no rhyming here. We have tetanus of the muscles, which if you remember is basically... Um, just constant muscle contraction, which is very painful. And then your fingers and toes can be all tingly, which is just really kind of uncomfortable. 
Potassium, another cation. Um, most of your potassium is located in your intracellular fluid. Okay, so up until now, most everything we've been talking about has been extracellular fluid, but most of your potassium is inside your cells, which works to maintain osmotic pressure inside the cells. And if you remember, Potassium is also involved in action potentials, right? So anytime we needed to talk about repolarization, um, potassium was always involved. It's easy to forget that potassium is also regulated by aldosterone. Um, when we talk about aldosterone, the focus is almost always on sodium reabsorption and then water being reabsorbed passively. Um, because it's following the sodium. But if you are reabsorbing sodium, you are actually secreting potassium. Okay, so aldosterone does play a role in potassium reabsorption and secretion. Now, if you have too much potassium, hyperkalemia, you'll have muscle weakness, cramps, constipation, which is awful. And if we have too little hypokalemia, you'll still have weak muscles, um, but you'll be tired and this could affect your heart and you could end up with cardiac arrhythmias. Okay. So we don't tend to talk about potassium a whole lot, okay? But nobody wants cardiac arrhythmias, so it is important. All right, chlorine is our first anion, our negatively charged ion. This is the most common anion in the extracellular fluid. It helps to maintain osmotic pressure in the extracellular fluid, so we've seen that a couple of times. But we know it probably best for being a component of hydrochloric acid, also known as your stomach acid. This is also regulated by aldosterone. You could have too little or too much um, chlorine. It doesn't really happen a whole lot, so we just kind of throw the words around and we're just going to kind of move on. To bicarbonate because we talk a lot about bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is part of the blood buffer system, which works with carbonic acid and carbon dioxide, um, and it works to provide short-term compensation for pH changes in your plasma. Okay. Um, bicarbonate works by either binding to or releasing um, hydrogen ions, which don't forget hydrogen ions are basically acid. Okay. Uh, bicarbonate is also regulated by aldosterone. Okay, so as like we're just aldosterone experts at this point, y'all. Just every chapter we're talking about aldosterone because it's a big deal. Now, um, pH changes. Okay, acidosis and alkalosis. We've thrown around these terms a few times as well. We know that we could have a respiratory problem or we can have a metabolic problem. Okay, so if we are suffering from respiratory acidosis, our lungs. Um, or perhaps maybe we're hypoventilating, we've got too much acid uh, floating around. So what are we going to do? Our kidneys are going to reabsorb okay, a bunch of bicarbonate, which acts as a base in this case, which would increase our blood pH. If the opposite is happening, if our lungs are bringing, if we're hyperventilating, if we're blowing off too much carbon dioxide, then we are not going to reabsorb the bicarbonate for a little while, which would help us decrease the blood pH because the bicarbonate, uh, or the, excuse me, the carbon dioxide and the carbonic acid, the hydrogen ions would all be sticking around to decrease that pH. Now, if the metabolism is our problem, okay, if our kidneys are our problem, we've got metabolic acidosis, how are we going to fix that? We've got too much acid. We're going to need to um, hyperventilate. The, this will um, get rid of a bunch of carbon dioxide, which means we're getting rid of um, the carbonic acid. Okay, we're also going to um, do kind of the opposite if we're doing if we're suffering from metabolic alkalosis. Right, that pH has gotten too high, so we'll want to hypoventilate, um, increase carbon dioxide, increase um, carbonic acid. Okay, that would bring that um, blood pH back down to a normal range. So again, we've mentioned these a couple of times here and there, so hopefully that is review at this point.
Now, we've talked about fluid intake and fluid output. We've talked about the different compartments, intracellular and extracellular fluid. And we said that these fluids, they're not stagnant. They do move, right? There tends to be little to no bulk movement, but water does move in and out of our cells um, and our tissues on a regular basis, and that's perfectly normal. The direction in which way the water moves is regulated by osmosis, um, or excuse me, osmotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure, okay? Now, really hoping you're remembering these terms at this point. We've mentioned osmotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure several times um, throughout the last few body systems. Water is free to move between the compartments. We do osmosis. Okay, but the solutes are unable to move as freely because either they're too big, they have charges, things like that, so they can't do osmosis. Um, they're more likely to do like facilitated diffusion, and so there's just not quite as much movement. Because water does move freely, and because solutes don't move as freely, we end up with concentration differences, okay, um, in the two compartments, the ECF and the ICF. Anything that changes the concentration of solutes in any of these compartments will ultimately mean that water is going to move as well. So anything that we do to change solute concentration means we are also going to have water moving somewhere. Okay. Now, again, hopefully a lot of this looks familiar to you already, filtration and reabsorption. So. We do have uh, fluids moving between your plasma and your interstitial space. Okay, kind of back and forth, back and forth. If you remember, filtration tends to be favored when your hydrostatic pressure is greater than your blood osmotic pressure. This means that fluids are moving out of the capillaries at the arterial end. Okay, um, and we can just throw some numbers around here. And then reabsorption will be favored when your blood osmotic pressure is greater than your hydrostatic pressure. The fluids will move back into the capillaries. Remember, this normally happens at your venule end. And again, we can throw some uh, numbers here. You'll notice um, that your hydrostatic pressure does change. It's 35 at your arterial end, for example. It might drop to only about 15 to 17 at your venule end. But remember, your blood osmotic pressure does not change, so it's 26. Um, at the arterial end, it is still 26 at the capillary end, okay? Um, just to remind you, what is creating your blood osmotic pressure? It's those proteins like albumin, okay? And again, those are just constant throughout the entire capillary. Net filtration pressure, so the difference between the hydrostatic and the osmotic pressures at the overall um, capillary. At the arterial end, net filtration is approximately 10 uh, millimeters of mercury, so we've got net filtration going on. At the venule end or the venous end, we've dropped to negative eight, so we've got net reabsorption occurring. So again, we've got fluids moving out of the capillary, but we've got fluids moving back in at the other end. 90% of fluid filtered at the arterial end is then reabsorbed at the venous end. Now you'll notice that we're only at 90%. What about the other 10%? That other 10% um, it is moved into the lymph vessels, okay? Which you hopefully remember in the lymph vessels will turn will return that lymph fluid to your subclavian veins so it can re-enter your bloodstream. Now, just to quickly remind you of how osmosis works because that's going to be important in our next section. Um, tonicity really is describing the concentration gradients between two solutions. So um, we almost always show uh, a red blood cell just because that's easy to pop into our mind. So we are going to compare the solute concentrations of the intracellular and the extracellular fluid. And if the concentrations are not equal, then water is going to um, favor moving in one direction or another. So normally, we'll start here in the middle, normally we have an isotonic solution. 
okay, which means the concentration of solutes inside the cell and outside of the cell are the same because ISO is the same, okay. Um, what does this do for the water? That means as a little bit of water comes in, a little bit of water goes out, okay. We are moving water at an equal rate, okay, which means overall there is no net water movement, okay, because everybody's moving equally. And this means that the size of the cell just remains the same. Now, again, this is normal, this is preferred, our body is happy here. Um, sometimes we end up with a hypotonic uh, solution outside the cell, so the extracellular fluid would become hypotonic, meaning that there is more solute inside the cell. Okay, there's less solute outside the cell. Water always wants to move to where the higher solute concentration is. So if you have more solute inside the cell, notice that water is coming right along with it. Um, this will cause net water movement into the cell, and if it's too much, you could lice or blow up your little cells, um, your red blood cells and any of your cells. They don't work very well if you blow them up. So this is bad, or it could be bad. Okay, if it goes on too long. And then the opposite could also happen. If you're in a hypertonic solution, if you have more solutes outside of the cell compared to inside of the cell, the water from the intracellular fluid moves out of the cell and your little cells shrivel up. Now again, your little red blood cells and any of your cells, they don't work quite as well Okay, if they're all shriveled up like this. Um, you might hear the term crenation. Okay, so crenate or crenation just means shriveled as well. Okay, so again, we don't want to blow ourselves up. We don't want to shrink them like raisins. We want to be in an isotonic solution if at all possible.